Thank you. This is an incredible privilege for me. My wife Jenny and I are great admirers of Randy Clark, and we thank the Lord for all that the Global Awakening Ministry is doing. So it's an enormous privilege to be invited to contribute just a little. It's my conviction that we're living in a civilizational moment. After 500 years of dominance, the West is in decline. The American Republic, the West's lead society, is suffering its gravest crisis since the Civil War. We can see the emergence of totalitarian China and what's called singularity and the prospect of transhumanism, an extraordinary generation for humanity. And I want to talk about our faithfulness and responsibility as followers of Jesus responding to an incredible hour like this one. Let me try and introduce four talks. One, on what it means to follow Jesus at this moment. Two, one, in terms of serving God's purpose in this generation, a sense of timing. And then thirdly, one on understanding the horizon of opportunities and crises that we're facing today. And then fourthly, the significance of the challenge, particularly to America and its ideas of freedom. I was born in China. My grandparents before me and my parents were medical missionaries in China. And we lived at the end in Nanking, which had been the capital of the Ming Dynasty. Nanking had been brutalized by the rape of Nanking under the Japanese in 1937-38. And it had suffered badly in World War II. But you could still see the beauty of the old Ming capital. Because in 1500, Nanking was the most powerful, prosperous city in the world. The Chinese emperor sent a fleet of ships to Africa, four times the size of the ships of Christopher Columbus. No one in their right mind would have thought that anyone would rival the Chinese empire, let alone some country on the western landmass of Asia. And yet, of course, you know, that's what happened. Suddenly in 1600, Europe arose and for 400 years, 500 years, dominated not only China, but the world. When the Chinese began to recover strength, there was a famous conference at the Chinese Academy of the Social Sciences. And they raised the question, what happened? Why did the West and Europe dominate? And they looked at politics and the military and law and economics. Yes, they said this factor or that factor made a difference, but they weren't the real reason. And their final conclusion was, what made the difference? Western religion, which of course is the Christian faith. Now, when they said that, a Jewish scholar jumped in and said, well, that's not actually quite right. Because if you think the Christian faith was the official faith of Rome in 380 under the Emperor Theodosius, but never dominated the world. What was it that in the 16th century made the difference? And the Jewish scholars pointed out it was the Reformation. The Reformation, going back to the Bible and rediscovering the great truths of the Bible, and they made the impact on the rise of the modern world. Now, you've often heard that it's boiled down to three big C's. One, covenant. I'll say later, but that notion of Hebrew covenant became, for example, the U.S. Constitution. A second C was the notion of conscience, particularly with wonderful Baptist leaders like Roger Williams and many others. 
You had the rise of religious freedom and the birth of what eventually became human rights. But I want to talk about the third one, calling. Because the rediscovery of the biblical notion of calling in many ways put its stamp on the enterprise and dynamism. And one scholar even thought it's behind the rise of modern capitalism. Calling is the deepest sense of purpose and fulfillment in the whole of human history. Now, of course, the biblical view is very different from many of the other faiths, philosophies, and worldviews. I grew up in the East. When I was in my 20s, I studied in Rishikesh under a Hindu guru. If you look at Hinduism and Buddhism, what do they say about purpose and fulfillment? You could put it in two words. Forget it. Why? As individuals, when we take ourselves seriously, we're caught in a world of illusion. And the goal in the East is not freedom to be an individual. It's freedom from individuality, because being an individual is the problem. And the goal is like the salt merging with water or the river flowing in the ocean, to lose the individuality and go back to being one with the ground of being an impersonal sense of God. How about our Western friends who are atheists and secularists? You could put their answer in three words. Do it yourself. When I was a student, I used to listen to Bertrand Russell. His picture of human purpose was the Greek giant Atlas who carried the world of his own meaning on his own shoulders. Why? There's no meaning in the universe. So if you want meaning, it's not out there for you to discover. You've got to do it yourself. Make it yourself and so on. Now, that's great if you're young, healthy, and if you've got a good bank balance, you feel you can do it. But most people realize that's impossible. Not surprising, the deepest sense of purpose in human history is the biblical, the Jewish and Christian notion of calling. Calling means be who you are, created in the image of God. But not only that, that by itself could be static. Calling means become whom you can become, not just created in the image of God, but called by God. And our Lord who calls us knows us far better than we know ourselves better than those closest, our family, our spouse, or our brothers and sisters, or our closest friends knows. He knows us. Our gifts, our personality, all that we can be. And as we follow the call, we rise to be all that he has in mind for us. Now, this notion of calling begins, of course, with Abraham, the first responder. With Abraham, an individual, and then a family, and then, under Moses, the Jewish people. And we have the great calls right through the Hebrew Scriptures, our Old Testament, and supremely, Jesus himself. Follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me. And quite literally, those two words are two words that change the world as followers of Jesus, have risen, listening to his call, follow me, and gone out and lived for him. Now, this is profoundly personal and spiritual and biblical and theological, but it's made an incredible practical difference in history and in society. And I just want to mention some of the things that have made such a practical difference because that's what we need today. The scandal of so much of the Western church is that people know the Lord, but it hasn't made that difference in the whole of their lives right out into society. What are some of the practical differences? Well, first, notice that calling has always meant, as it was for Abraham, leave. The first word to Abraham, 
leave, or as the Jews put it, your country, your culture, and your kin. Leave the forces that determine you and your culture and shape you all around you naturally. Leave and follow me. And from then onwards, there's always been that call to break and live a different way. God's new way, his project, his mission in history. And we have the privilege of being a part of it. But we break. Be not conformed, but transformed by the renewing of our mind. We are in the world, yes, as our Lord says, but we're not of the world. Or as St. Augustine put it, we're members of the city of man, this city, that city, this town, that town, but we are primarily members of the city of God. And the city of man will always fall away, but the city of God endures. And there should always be that breaking and that leaving. And the trouble, particularly in much of the Western world, is that Christians aren't that different today. And we're like many people around us. Whereas God's new way always begins with a cost, but with the courage to break and to leave and to follow him and his different way. A second great implication. Calling means be who you are. I love the story. I don't know if you know the great conductor, violinist, Yehudi Menuhin. He grew up in San Francisco in a poor Jewish family who loved music. And they took him every weekend to the symphony. And he was fascinated from the earliest age with the first violinist. And when he was nearly four, his father said to him, Yehudi, what would you like for your birthday? They were poor and little Yehudi said, I'd love a violin. No idea, it was rather expensive. His father laughed and mentioned it to a friend, and the friend gave him, to humor him, a toy violin, metal, with metal strings. And Menuhin, when he was 80, and a world-famous violinist, and had two Stradivariuses himself, said that when he got this toy violin at the age of four, he knew it was all wrong. He said, I even then knew that for me, to play was to be. And he took the toy violin and smashed it in front of his father's friend, not realizing how rude that was. But he was right, of course. Now, geniuses and maestros, that gift bubbles through very early on. A Mozart and so on. Most of us are not like that. We have many gifts, maybe, but they're much more moderate. But as we grow up, we discover who we are and we're most happy, most filled with joy when we're doing what's us. We're doing the things that God created us to be. And of course, that's right. Because he's created us and he's given us the gifts, spiritual gifts, natural gifts. And when we exercise those, we are most ourselves. Now, of course, there can be dangers in that. This teaching today about the so-called sweet spot, almost as if the world was here to fulfill us. All we need to do is find our sweet spot and life will be terrific. No, often the things that are our deepest gift may not be enormously well remunerated or popular or appreciated even, and maybe totally against the grain of a culture going against our Lord today. So there may be a cost to it, but even if there's a cost to it, and what you long to see doesn't happen in your lifetime. There's still an immense joy in being who you are and using the gifts God has given us. And so the challenge is to say, Lord, you've made me who I am. Help me to know fully who I am and to have the freedom to be who you've made me to be to your glory. Well, take a third implication. And this one has made an incredible impact in history. Calling means everyone, everywhere, in everything. 
My family were friends and supporters of the great William Wilberforce, who led the abolition of slavery and many other things. But if you know Wilberforce's story, when he was a young man, wealthy, as he went to Cambridge, he said, I was gambling and whoring and clubbing. He lived totally for himself. And then in his early 20s, came to faith. And it was such a contrast being committed to Christ, to living for himself earlier, that he thought, well, I've got to change my life completely. Obviously, I've got to drop out of what I'm doing. He was a member of parliament and the best friend of the youngest prime minister in British history, who himself was only 24. Wilberforce said, I've got to drop out of parliament and become a minister. Surely it's more spiritual to be a minister than a member of parliament and a politician. Mercifully, a minister, John Newton, who's well known for the author of Amazing Grace, said to him, for heaven's sake, don't. Stay where you are and ask God what he wants you to do where you are. And so for two years, Wilberforce stayed in parliament and prayed. And at the end of two years, he wrote down in his journal what's sometimes reckoned to be the boldest mission statement ever written. He said, God Almighty has set before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of manners, which is the old word for moral standards. He did both. He stayed in Parliament believing that was God's post for him, as he put it. At one stage, he was a member of 69 different initiatives. Some were openly spiritual, the world's first Bible society. He founded the first society for the protection of cruelty to animals. He founded London's National Gallery for the Arts, as well as fighting for the abolition of slavery and writing books that encourage many, many people to come to know our Lord. It was everyone, everywhere, in everything. No higher and lower, no sacred secular divide. Everyone, everywhere, in everything. And of course, that was a wonderful rediscovery of the Reformation. You were not more holy as a minister or a missionary or an evangelist. Martin Luther said, you've got to do it when you're washing the dishes. Actually, he talks about changing diapers. And William Tyndale talks about washing dishes because it was everyone, everywhere, in everything. Or take another implication. Following the call of Jesus means living before one audience, the audience of one. Now, if you think we all have audiences that we're aware of, we're members of family or sports teams or work teams or communities or whatever, nothing wrong with audiences. If a doctor had no clients, he wouldn't be much of a doctor. I'm a writer, if I had no readers, I wouldn't be much of a writer. We all have audiences, nothing wrong with that. But the question is, which audience matters to you more than any other? Because our modern world is described as, by scholars, other-directed. It's said that the world of the Reformation was inner-directed, and our modern world is other-directed. We have polling and focus groups and likes and followers and, and so on. We're always aware of what others are thinking. 51% believe this now, or whatever. It's said of the Puritans that they were as if they'd swallowed gyroscopes. In other words, their north, south, east to west, their bearings were inside them. Why? Because of calling before one audience, the audience of one. Whereas modern Christians are as if, the same scholar said, we have fought, swallowed gallop poles. We're all interested now in what the crowd is doing, what everyone's into this year, what's relevant now, and so on and so forth. No. 
If we have a sense of call, what's right or wrong or important or less important is totally a matter of the audience of one, our Lord. Now, with some people, that means incredible cost and incredible courage. They may stand against their family, stand against their community, stand against their work team, because they know something's right and they're going to stand. And in this life, it might be extremely painful. And as we know from our brothers and sisters around the world, that might be the end of their life or the end of their freedom, landing them in jail. But they live before one audience, the audience of one. One last thing I'll mention. Calling means that we're able in some small way to interpret the meaning of our life looking back as we followed that sense of calling. Søren Kierkegaard, the great Danish Christian philosopher, he said, life is lived forward but understood backward. We don't know the meaning of our life. Much of it we'll only know when we meet the Lord and we can see it from his perspective. But if we followed our calling, we can look back and begin to see a little of how we connect the dots and see our life gaining the meaning it is because we have a sense of calling. I was talking to a leader from the Middle East recently who was retiring and a little puzzled as to what he was doing. And I said to him very simply, you retire from a job. He was a very eminent leader in his community, but you never retire from a calling. In other words, when we follow Jesus, follow me. Those two words have come to us in all our life imperfectly. We've got up and we're following him. Now, remember, when we do that, we only hear him. The Greeks and most of the religions of the world are, is a matter of seeing. Seeing is relatively rare in scripture. We have the seers and so on. Hearing is the normal. Hear, O Israel, Shema. In this life, we mostly hear. We don't see the Lord. Very few have seen the Lord. But when we die, for the first time, it won't just be hearing, we will see him. And the one who's been the caller all these years will then be the one we see face to face. And of course, then the whole of our life becomes meaningful. We hope we hear him say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. I would suggest to you, if you look at the biblical notion of calling from Abraham right through to Revelation and from the early church right down to our own age, calling is one of the great themes that are distinctive in the Bible and above all in Jesus our Lord. And it isn't just a spiritual truth. It's a spiritual theological truth which when we follow it, leads us out across the whole arena of life and puts a greater stamp on history than almost any other truth except the cross and the power of the Holy Spirit. So as we look at our modern world today, this first thing we need absolutely, Christians who clearly are answering the call and living all their lives with a sense of purpose and engagement and fulfilling, because our lives are a response and answering to the great call of Jesus. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you like the content that you receive from this channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Also, give us a thumbs up and share our content with all of your friends and family. It really helps us out. We also invite you to consider partnering with us. We're a nonprofit ministry with a mission to awaken the world to the power of the gospel. If you'd like to help us continue creating content, consider giving at the link on the screen or text the word donation to 21,000. 
If you want even more of our spirit-filled content, consider a subscription to globalondemand.tv, our subscription video platform. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.